All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Explore MedTech seminar. Uh, we really appreciate you being here today. Um, my name is Mohammed Adnan Saib. I'm the director of the MedTech Talent Accelerator. Now, before we um, move to the event itself, um, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement. Um, so Toronto, where I'm located, uh, or also known as Tuckeronto, is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. Um, the Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabes, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Um, subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and request and respect. Sorry about that. Um, so with that, you know, and again, keeping that in mind, you know, uh, I'd like to welcome our speaker, Mark Saab, um, from founding, founder and managing director at BML Health. Um, Mark is a passionate business leader with 20 years of experience in medical device and digital health. His expertise is in all aspects of medical device products, uh, from conception to launch to validation and entering international markets and also in business development. Um, he's also an expert in biometrics and a thought leader in digital health. Um, so with that, you know, Mark, I'd like to, you know, pass it right to you. Um, we're all here to hear from you. So please take it away. Thank you, Adnan. I appreciate it very much. And thank you, everybody. It's quite a nice turnout. I wasn't sure what to expect. So this is great. I uh, appreciate you all being here on a little bit short notice. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and maybe Adnan, you could let me know if, uh, if that's coming through. Okay. Yes, I, I can see it. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, great. So the, the title of my presentation is really axed around developing health technology, but, uh, less on the tech and more on getting it into where it really matters, which is the clinical environment. So in any business, the, the, uh, term that we use for that market penetration is adoption and in our world i'm going to make the case that it's heavily heavily dependent among other things but on the one that i want to talk to you about today which is clinical workflow integration so again thank you uh, medtech talent accelerator for the invitation i appreciate it very much and um oh one thing i wanted to say this is a presentation that typically that i've given to grad students that are in biomedical engineering and developing tech with a a view of entering the health tech field. And I see from uh, from the chat that there's quite a lot of uh, biomedical engineers and, and uh, other science disciplines, but that are in the medical tech, uh, that are studying med technology now. And it's nice to be able to speak to you about what you can expect uh, when you join, when you join the, uh, when you join industry. Okay, so let me see, the slides are moving, that's great. Okay, so in the commercial space, you know, in consumer technology, it, it's very um, tangible for most people. All of us understand what disruption looks like in the consumer space and in consumer technology. So when we talk about these types of products, these are products that not only we have a visceral reaction to, that we associate even our identity to at times, that become such a ubiquitous part of our lives that they even change the way we do things. You know, understanding what disruption looks like here is very straightforward for most people. In our world of medical technology, um, you know, while these devices are are common for us and we, we understand where we see them and how they're used, most people don't really know what goes into something uh, of this nature, getting it out into the field and commercializing it. Uh, you know, as, as biomedical engineers, we rarely chat with people outside the field that even understand what we do more or less. But these are all devices that have been created with a very specific use case in mind for a very specific reason and for a very select group of people to use. So a lot goes into that and making sure that that gets done in the right way. You know, when we think of medical devices and, and traditional medical devices, we think of a scene like this, you know, some equipment that's usually tethered and is usually on a cart and we've got physicians and other healthcare practitioners interacting with it. Um, and this is the way that it's been for a very long time, of course. More recently, and even more so, 
uh, in the past couple of years after through the pandemic and after the pandemic, these types of devices are starting to come into the marketplace. And when we say marketplace, you know, in our world, we mean in the clinical environment. And um, I've chosen these four specifically for the reason that they are licensed and cleared as medical devices. So the first one in the corner is the loop uh, wearable from Spry Medical that actually a, a Montreal founder but that exited the company in California. And that's a wearable device for COPD monitoring. The second one, a wonderful, wonderful device from Switzerland called the Actia um, cuffless blood pressure. So it's gotten a lot of momentum recently, but I remember when they were uh, developing that, that comes from 15 years of R&D uh, in one of the top universities in Europe. So no small task getting that on the market. The third one, another really, really great device, the Cardia Mobile, is a uh, wireless handheld medical grade electrocardiogram that records right on your phone. And it's an ingenious little device because you can't see it from that picture, but it actually records six leads uh, because there's an electrode on the back of that device that you can put on your thigh, believe it or not. So that gives you right hand, left hand, and uh, and one of your thighs. Um, amazing medical grade uh, quality on your cell phone. And the fourth one in the bottom right corner is our friend that we all that we all know well. The, the watch itself isn't actually a medical device, but the algorithms that they're developing with medical um, intended uses are cleared with the FDA and, and registered as medical devices around the world. So, this, you know, this kind of thing is causing uh you know uh, allowing for ma you know exciting and major possibilities while at the same time causing a whole new set of challenges that we're not necessarily used to dealing with along that same in that same vein you know along the same lines we get these kind of devices that are not only novel in the medical space but that are even novel in consumer space so um, not everybody around us has interacted with VR and used VR and when developing medical technology on a VR platform, uh, I think the challenges are even greater you know, in that sense. Here's another uh, wonderful little device, a handheld, um, the new one is Bluetooth, this one is tethered, but a handheld ultrasound, again, medical quality registered and cleared with the FDA. Images come uh, right up on your phone. We'll be talking about something like that a little bit later. Here is another uh, handheld device for home use that comes from Israel. We actually helped them um, license this device in Canada. It's called the N9 Plus from Nonagon, and it does a whole, whole bunch of amazing things. You could measure all of these things at home, an adult on themselves or an adult on their child. Uh, there's photography, there's uh, otorology, there is um, a digital stethoscope, temperature, SpO2, and of course, all of that is fed uh, directly to a, a platform for the physician to interact with. So again, um, amazing possibilities in terms of disrupting healthcare and, and care delivery, but also you can think of a whole slew of challenges that we'll be talking about. And this one is particularly of interest because often the populations that we want to serve um, in the use cases in which they most need um, you know, where, where the biggest gaps are in our service providing, you know, people being monitored at home that actually require continuous monitoring may not necessarily be the best people to interact with new kinds of technology, right? So here, this, this lady has clearly got the cuff on in the right place and she's smiling and everything's going great. Uh, but you can imagine when the, you know, the elderly or uh, people that are not necessarily tech savvy are, are challenged by this new kinds of technology. You can think of all the issues that arise. So all that to say, I love this graphic, I didn't put any text on it, but all that to say that developing health technology, considering some of the things I've mentioned and some of the things we'll be talking about is no small feat. So if you're thinking of becoming a tech health tech startup founder, this is what your life is gonna be like. Uh, but I assure you that if you get over that, that initial push, uh, the benefits are wonderful and we need you okay so this is kind of fun for me but i like to show that um I've, I've been in health tech for my entire career i'm a very proud uh graduate of the biomedical engineering program at mcgill university uh, class of 2003 and now i run a company in montreal called bml health which is mainly 
uh, our our mission is to well our I'm sorry our our value to the to the field is to help companies develop this kind of emerging tech and work with new challenges but also what drives us and what we're passionate about is uh, we feel that we're in the middle of a, a healthcare revolution uh, and we want to be part of it and I can say that as as grad students in biomedical engineering and other sciences and disciplines that lead to health technology you're going to be part of that when you enter the workforce either in a company that's developing health tech or in a startup uh, it's an amazing, amazing time to be in this field. So I'm very happy that I chose it so many years ago. Uh, and I'm in a way, I guess, welcoming you to it and uh, hoping that you find it as exciting as I have. All right, so with that introduction, we'll get into it. Um, again, this is some, some very basic stuff, but I thought it helps set the stage. And even before talking about health technology, just some the concepts around market adoption, again, very basic. I'm not pretending to give a grad level course in um, uh, in marketing, but you know, before you think about what you're going to do with that with the technology, you really need to think about where it ends up before you think about what you're you're doing as an engineer, right? So the number one question, of course, in market adoption is who is the end user, who is your customer, and who are you really developing this for? And beyond that, who are they? What do they do? What do they need? And what do they struggle with? We call those pain points. That's a very commonly used term in this context. Um, what need of theirs are, is your solution going to address? And uh, we can't stress enough that thinking about this first before thinking about the technology or the, or the use of it um, is, is critical. It's uh, very strategic. And then once you have that, what makes you different from what's out there? What is your differentiator? How are you unique? Um, how are you positioning your, your company and your product to be different than, than what's already out there? And that early adoption where people um, start to get into your solution, start to use your tech and start to enjoy it, that is the beginning of the business. That's not a business. When do you hit the tipping point and when does adoption really kick in so that you start being profitable and, and really making an impact on the field, critical, critical early considerations. Um, and then you'll have your, um, your business development and your marketing teams, hopefully early, early on understanding what kind of challenges you're going to hit. Notice that I'm not talking about technology development and features and, um, and that kind of technical work, you know, where, where is your device headed in the business context? Um, how is that going to influence the decisions you make as a company? What is the business case? Um, and perhaps a crude way of saying, you know, what is the business? How does money change hands and between whom and how and when? And these are critical, critical things in basic sales and marketing and, and business development. Um, in our field, we're going to talk about how it's even more complex. So this is a graphic that I like very much. Uh, you may have seen it, you may not. It's, it's a very, very, very simplified approach to developing a value proposition. It comes from the Lean Business Model Canvas. Uh, as soon as I learned it, I loved it, and I, I think about it all the time in, in everything we do. Uh, it's a really, really simple way to ensure that we're market focused and that we're driven by the market and not by the company outward, but by the market pulling us inward. And we start by describing, so we're going to go right to left here. We start by describing our, our client and our customer and our end user and really understanding what their raison d'etre is and, and why they're doing what they're doing. So we call that, you know, jobs to be done, but who are they and what do they do? And then in context of that, there's things that they want to improve what they're doing, you know, gains, and there's things that they struggle with and make it difficult to do what they're doing, you know, those pains. And then on our side, before we just, you know, before we think about developing technology, if you, you know, if you build your strategy in this way, then you aim your game creators directly at potential gains of your clients. So how can you improve what they're doing? And this one is, uh, you know, for me is usually where I end up, uh, in, which is in pain relief. Um, I think a, a lot of business gets done in pain relief. Maybe it's more rewarding in game creation, but my career has been mostly in pain relief, so I understand it very well. But if you understand the pains of your client or the things they're struggling with, only then can you really start to offer them solutions. And then based on these two things, that's when you develop your products and services. Rather than going left to right and potentially getting it wrong, 
uh, this is a, a really simple way to make sure that everything you do is focused on on the client at the end of the day and the real user. So as I said, in our world, um, how do we apply that and who is our customer in the health technology market? And we're going to talk about it, but it's something that I like to call the five headed monster, which doesn't sound very inviting, or very simple. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, who, who that is. So we know very well that the need for innovation, um, you know, it's, it's no coincidence that the field is really, really blossoming right now. And there's so much more interest in it than there was even 20 years, you know, 20 years ago and even 10 years ago, but the need for innovation uh, is clear. All of us interact with the health, with healthcare and, and understand where the gaps are. Even before you get in the field, just as a patient, you understand where the gaps are. And when you're in the field, they're even more evident. But this is a picture of a appointment management and staff management desk. And it is uh, from a hospital in Europe. I won't pinpoint exactly where, but I can tell you that this picture was not taken 20 years ago. It was in the last couple of years. It's, it's a modern hospital. And you can see that they are functioning with cue cards and, and uh, name plates and a physical schedule that they manipulate. There is a computer here. It's off in the corner. It looks like a 486. So I don't, that doesn't date the picture. It just means they have a very old computer there. But I can tell you that they're, they're functioning this way because it's working. Now, can it be better? I'm sure all of us can think of software platforms that could do this better. Is it better for these individuals here? Maybe not. We'll talk about maybe why they're reticent to, to evolve from that. And, and everybody knows what this is. Um, I gotta be honest, I still don't know what all these the, the color the color coding is. I would be lost in a in a file system like this, but it's uh it's served its purpose for years and I think we can agree that it's outdated and um there's a lot that can be improved there, but a major, major portion, uh, the proportion of uh medical record transacting is done in this way still. Uh so like you know, if like I said, the need for innovation is really, really obvious. Um, and this is a wonderful, wonderful device from back in the day. And many of you, <laughs> I like to joke that many of you don't, don't, don't know what it is, but you probably do, but you may or may not. Uh, it's a phone and you send a piece of paper to another phone. It's a mind boggling, mind boggling thing, right? But when this was invented, it was an incredible invention. Uh, and now it's, it's, uh, shocking. Um, to realize that a, a major portion of, you know, healthcare information in, interaction and transaction is done with the fax machine. In Quebec, it's still the primary source of information exchange. Um, and it's done its job until now, and it's, it's, you know, it's functioned well enough, but it's really time to do better. And uh, th like I said, the, the field is ripe for, uh, for new technologies and new solutions. This is, you know, not my favorite way of, of, describing this, but it's just a quick and crude kind of way to test the waters, but just a simple search in Google for AI in healthcare. There's a lot of other ways to look at this, you know, huge uh, field, but, you know, 3 trillion uh, results because it's a massive, massive topic and we're just scratching the surface on, on what it can do and what it shouldn't do. Right? So from where you're sitting, you, you, you may have an, an idea, you may have some uh, you know, some early test results, you might have some prototypes, you might have some thoughts for a business. And we know that, like I said, there's so much opportunity that this amazing idea will change the world and you should be very motivated. But where do you start? Do you start from the tech, an exclamation mark or a question mark? It's a big mistake. You don't want to start from the tech. But where most um, grad students and researchers are sitting is usually with some pretty you know, pretty neat idea that has shown some promise from either uh, a postgrad project, even your own master's work or, or PhD work or postdoc work. Um, somebody who has, is doing some phenomenal research that has an idea to, um, you know, uh, translate that into industry, a doctor or a clinician that's every day realizing that there's a, a real clear clinical gap that you could address and, and you've come up with some ideas. Um, or often, I, I don't want to say hackathon, but sometimes there's um, stuff comes from, you know, great ideas come out of these uh, development competitions and these, and these pushes for innovation. And all of that can create and lead to, like I said, these wonderful, 
wonderful ideas. Um, but really where we should start when we're developing medical technology, as I said, thinking about who our customer is and what their pains and gains are, uh, we call that the unmet clinical need. So finding a true clinical gap somewhere where there's a real need for an innovation that can change things uh, is usually a really, really good place to start. I'll, I'll say, I can say the best place to start, but one of the best places to start. Um, and we've seen it in a couple of places. So this is a nice graphic from Centech and, and our good friend Steve Arliss, who's um, who certainly has experience developing and commercializing medical technology. This is his framework for development. As you can see, a very, very uh, important um, early factor is this unmet clinical need. That's where we like to start. And even from our friends at McGill, this is the biomedical engineering uh, framework. You can see that the start of the roadmap, again, either some science on the left or a healthcare need. So it's it's the right place to start um, thinking about your client and the use case, as I said. Now, considering adoption, how do we go about identifying this critical factor that I mentioned? <clears throat> Excuse me. So as I said, it's a critical first step. It's where we normally want to start. And a simple customer need is not the answer. So like, like I gave as an example, uh, you know, the use of paper records is, is limited. That's not enough to sink your teeth in. And neither is some wonderful tech, killer app, an amazing feature, um, some scientific breakthrough. <clears throat> These are all fundamentally important aspects of medical tech development, but they're not really going to lead us to adoption is my contention. On top of it, significant criteria needs to be met before we can even get our innovation to become a viable commercial product. So first and second, I've got them together. You may recognize some a theme here, but I'll, I'll describe it in a second. But first we can ensure, we should ensure that we're doing no harm. So we're going back to the, um, you know, the root medical creed Number one, we need safety. And number two, it actually has to work. And we'll talk about what has to work means, but this is basically code language for, or sorry, um, more common language for safety and efficacy. That's what we're after here. It's gotta be safe and it's gotta work. It should solve a real clinical problem, not just be a wonderful proof of concept, but actually solve a problem that exists in the clinical space. And it has to be usable in a real clinical setting. Now that's different than efficacy and it's different than solving a real clinical problem, even though we use the word clinical over and over. This is actual integration into the place where people really use your technology on a daily basis. And that is a big challenge. And it also something we probably think about last, uh, it should actually lead to a viable business. It actually should generate revenue and it, it's really helpful to think of that as early as possible. Okay. So let's go one by one. So first and second, safety and efficacy. First, safety. Um, you know, the, the, the main mandate of Health Canada in Canada and the FDA in the US is to ensure those two things. So the, before a product can be licensed for sale in Canada or cleared or approved for sale in the US, it absolutely must be safe and that it has to be certified. There are many standards and, and accredited, uh, you know, uh, test labs that will, that will help you do that. And it actually has to work. So that could involve, you know, proof of concept, bench testing, uh, you know, getting it working in the lab is one thing, but as a ISO 13485 certified medical device manufacturer, uh, there needs to be these very specific steps that allow you to ensure and show uh, proper safety and efficacy uh, and responsible design and development. So all of that exists. It's very well documented. It's very well understood. Um, and they're not just recommendations. They're federal law uh, mandated by Health Canada and the U.S. Now, you might have, uh, like I said, a, an amazing technological proof of concept. And I, you know, these come across my feed uh, daily. These are all amazing university projects that are, um, you know, measuring 
blood sugar from sweat, for example, measuring biometrics from the wrist on a flexible sensor, um, immediately you think of the ease of use, the inexpensive nature, the flexibility, the form factor, how it could fit into wearable clothing or, or, or other accessories, and the possibilities seem endless. But you know, on the ground floor running, we need to think about these things as R&D uh, and proof of concepts. And before something, some amazing breakthrough like this becomes a medical product that can actually be used clinically, uh, a lot, a lot has to be done. Okay, so on clinical performance, will it actually solve a clinical problem? And we're back to the second half of the, of the mandate of the regulatory agencies. And we need to show that the device will actually do clinically what we say. So will it actually be, uh, will it actually have efficacy? It's another major uh, requirement. Back to those wonderful prototypes, having them work on your wrist and on your lab partner's wrist and on your uh, office mate's wrist is one thing, but throwing it out uh, into a wildly diverse population um, is messy and unpredictable and, and getting it to work reliably, no matter who's wearing it, is a whole other challenge. Diversity is a wonderful thing for the world. Uh, it's a big, big, big problem for biomedical engineers developing tech, right? Call it a challenge. And I'm not even starting to talk about how AI is just going to magically parse through all that data and, and make it work. You know, there's a lot of responsible development that needs to happen. There's no magic bullet, unfortunately. So here's an example that I mentioned earlier of the handheld uh, ultrasound that when I... Um, when I saw it, I thought, wow, it's, this is really, really, really coming to, uh, into its own. You know, it's really the time for this stuff. And I thought this was an amazing, amazing device. And you can think about all of the ways that this is going to disrupt, uh, ultrasound measurement. It can be, you know, with, with EMT personnel uh, uh, in the ambulance. It can be anywhere in the hospital at any time. A physician can have it in their pocket. Um, and, and pull it out and, and take an ultrasound whenever they need to. It could facilitate uh, in the ER, in the OR, uh, in birthing. I mean, it's, it's, uh, the possibilities are endless. Um, and I actually have an anecdote about a device just like this, and I'm going to bring it up in a minute. But the reality of that amazing technological innovation is thinking about how to integrate it into the clinical environment is actually more challenging than you may think. And even at one point in my career, more challenging than I realized. And I had a wonderful, um, a, a real example of it. And what I realized and what was being said to me by a clinical engineer, let me uh, talk about clinical engineers for a minute. Clinical engineers, when we were going through biomedical engineering, there were these different Paths, but not that many. There was uh, research in academia, and there was clinical engineering in a hospital, which I misunderstood. To be honest, I thought um, they, you know, uh, these engineers will maintain the equipment and and make sure they're calibrated and and make sure things are uh, running smoothly and 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 people are trained properly. But what I didn't realize is that these clinical engineers are extremely extremely important in the adoption of new tech because they are a gatekeeper of sorts. They're involved at the top level of procurement and acquisition at the, in the hospital. And they're a very, very trusted resource for what kind of new tech is adopted. Um, that was the second example. And the third example was industry where biomedical engineers are developing technology. And that's where I chose to go. But the second category, or sorry, the second career path, I should say, um, was, was phenomenally interesting to me all of a sudden. They, they, a group of clinical engineers reached out to me and was asking me about wearables and we were talking and they kind of stopped me in my tracks because the, the, what they kept coming back to was, will it truly solve problems or will it actually make more? And I thought, make more, how could it make more? It's so innovative and amazing and, and solve so many problems. And these, um, you know, professionals with real integration experience kind of stopped me in my tracks and I'll, and I, I'm really, really thankful for that because in the example of the handheld device, it was a physician that had purchased it on the internet. And they came into the clinical engineer's office at the, in the hospital with the device in their pocket. And they took it out and said, can I use this? And the clinical engineer said, what the heck is it? So they were asking me, 
you know, how do I evaluate these things? And, and they said to the doctor, where did you get it? And the physician said, well, I ordered it on the internet. So the, so the clinical engineer said, okay, well, with, with your credit card and with your account, where's the app? The app is on, the app was on the doctor's phone. And the clinical engineer said, okay, leave it with me. And I said, what did you say to him? And he said, I said, no, I said, he can't use it. I said, but it's FDA cleared, you know, and it, and it, and it's working really well. It's, it's performing really, really well. And he said, listen, I, I, it, he by you know, the physician bypassed the entire procurement and acquisition uh, procedure in the hospital. There's a whole, you know, a review panel and, and, and budget assessments and decision-making process that happens. And then he said, and just on a logistical level, where are these things going to go and how are they going to be transported around the hospital and how easy is it to lose one and how are we going to track them? Right now we have a system that's based on carts and, and codes and scanning and this thing is too small and what am I going to do? Set up a charge bay for these things and is it going to be on the physician's phone or am I going to have to buy mobile phones for everybody? And as he was talking, I was saying, I was saying okay, wow, I, wow, I understand. You know, I didn't think of all this. And he said, and, and what about decommissioning? He said, I have these ultrasound machines. They don't decommission whenever we want them to decommission. There's a schedule and there's a whole process for decommissioning these ultrasounds. I have to train staff. I have to show them how to use the new device. And even before he got to the showstopper, the critical showstopper for me, which was how do I integrate the data? He said, you know, how do I get the data where the physician is going to see it? And when the physician had it on the app on his phone, he thought it's so great. It's on my phone, but in the grand scheme of the clinical operation of the hospital, that data is not making it anywhere further than it, that physician's phone. It needs to be in the system. So what, you know, the clinical engineer said all these other things that I thought, wow, I would have never thought of that with the types of things you think about are data integration and cybersecurity and data privacy and that sort of thing. You know, if the phone leaves the hospital, you, you historically never left an EHR uh, client portal at, at Tim Hortons on the counter, but you could leave your phone anywhere, right? So it, it, it's, it's introducing all kinds of new challenges. But what was amazing to me was the, the depth and breadth of these challenges uh, along the lines, as I said, of acquisition, deployment, uh, training, management of equipment. And then, as I said, what we think about, which is on the tech side, you know, data integration, cybersecurity, HIPAA, data privacy, but we don't think of the logistics of the clinical environment uh, and how we're going to integrate it as something new into something that's working. Um, and that's very, very complex and it's been around for a long time, you know, but um, here's how, here's how this anecdote turns. So uh, by amazing coincidence, I, I bumped into somebody that was at the company and that was heavily involved in sales. And I asked them and I said, I heard this amazing story about this wireless device, you know, this Bluetooth device uh, and that it was, uh, you know, difficult to integrate. And they said to me, yeah, we realized that it was extremely difficult to integrate. So uh, we put a lot of energy behind it. And this is a picture of Dallas uh, Children's Hospital uh, in Texas, the biggest pediatric hospital in the US. And he said, listen, we put a team of people on site, a five person team, including a general physician, a radiologist, uh, somebody from the tech team, so probably an engineer, uh, an IT specialist because of all that integration and probably an EHR specialist, but he called it an IT specialist and the sales account rep. He said, these five professionals are on site. And I immediately thought, wow, that's five hotel rooms and three meals a day. Uh, that, that gets expensive. Um, but it was amazing to me. I realized the, the intensity around what needed to be done. And he said, they're working with one department at a time and training and building the integration one department at a time. And in a live, uh, in a live presentation in a room with, with people, I like to ask how long do you think that team was there on site in Dallas? And they get different re responses, uh, you know, two weeks, two months. Um, and it was amazing to me that the team was on site for an entire year. Uh, and it was, it, and counting when I was speaking to this professional. So um, amazing the, just the, the level of, of investment of dollars and time and knowledge and learning uh, that went into it. And I said, how's it going now? He said, it's great. We're selling, you know, we're selling and they're using it and it's, um, it's being really, really well received and it's a great story, but the, the amount of work that it took to get it there. Uh, and then I didn't mention it to him, but I thought it in my head, you know, a good friend of mine will say, you see one clinical environment, uh, and you've seen one clinical environment. Uh, so that's a funny way to say that they're very different. Of course, they're, they're, they're big and they're complex, uh, and no two are exactly the same. So you can imagine the challenge of 
uh, getting something out in the field and having it be integrated in a in a positive way and in a constructive way, right? So there's no shortcuts. Here's an example I like a lot of a company that I think made a very good decision early on. They're called BioIntelliSense, and they make a very, very small, very lightweight, simple um, ECG monitor that replaces a Holter monitor. So this is a 30-day continuous. I should say that it's FDA cleared. So it's uh, responsibly designed and responsibly built, and it does what it needs to do very well, and it can last up to 30 days. So um, like I said, it's it's small, so it's not super invasive or intrusive, and it's adhered to the skin, and it feeds ECG, live streaming ECG data for 30 days continuous uh, to wherever you need it. So it records on the device, but it also transmits. And what I think is uh, really, really great and smart about what BioIntelliSense did is early on they partnered with Philips. Instead of figuring out at, you know later in the development that they would have to integrate this into a clinical workflow, as I've been talking about, uh, they partnered early on with Philips so that everywhere in a clinical center where there's a Philips infrastructure, the Philips EHR, and the Philips smart machines, uh, that this would speak directly to them and integration would be a lot easier. And they proved right because integration was um, a lot easier than starting cold and, and trying to do it on your own. Of course, in any business, you need to think of the business model. So will it generate revenue is one thing, but will it scale is very important. So you see in the case of one clinic at a time with a team of five people for a year, uh, if you're thinking business, you're thinking, holy moly, that's not going to be easy to scale. And that's a, that's a big barrier to, to growth and, and viability. Also, um, our five-headed monster, so I'll bring back our, our, my, my uh, funny way of describing our customer. Uh, it's very unique when you're in the consumer space, you think of product market fit, you know, is it the 18 to 35 demographic? Is it uh, North America? Is it Europe? You know, is it men? Is it women? Who are these people are, are usually um, in, in these kind of tidy categories. In healthcare, the customer can be up to five people and even more. So the person deciding that you're going to integrate that technology is not the person that actually purchases it. And the person that purchases it purchases it, excuse me, is not the one that's going to receive it and install it and get it set up and actually running. And the person who's going to operate it is yet another person. And then our physician who's supposed to be holding the phone and operating the device and have purchased it and have installed it and have configured it is also reading the data right off the phone. Well, in the real clinical case, the physician is not there when the measurement is made necessarily, often is looking at the data after the fact uh, and reporting back uh, to the patient after some delay. So these five people are involved in the use case and in the adoption, and uh, they don't always agree. Sometimes they do, and it's great. They're not even in the same place sometimes. So imagine the complexity. And then again, back to our value proposition and the unmet clinical need, the unmet clinical need is answering pains and gains for all five of these stakeholders. And also, you know, hopefully, the end beneficiary, who is the patient. I haven't even talked about the patient all this time, but um, the patient hopefully is getting better treatment and it's easier for them to, to receive it. And hopefully it's leading to better outcomes. I haven't even mentioned outcomes all this time, but just to show you that to get there, uh, a lot of work by a lot of people uh, ha has to be done. And hopefully, like I said, all these stakeholders uh, get to benefit and, and somehow agree, even though there might not even be in the same organization, but whether you like it or not, you have to serve all of their needs. So I'm looking at, I'm looking at the clock. I'll wrap up in a couple of minutes and then so we can move, but I'll illustrate uh, the, the point in this way. We're all talking about the digital health revolution or the healthcare revolution and how technology will change that. So I thought a simple model, especially with a group of engineers, this should resonate. So I, I thought of a simple model that will illustrate the ecosystem that we're, that we're involved in. And then this one didn't really, wasn't really clear for me. So I, I chose this one and this one had some nice arrows and pointing between stakeholders. But then I thought, you know, this one is much better because it has little people in it and, and people help us to understand things. But all the dotted lines and the blue lines, it was a little too confusing. So I said, you know what? I like this one because it really involves the entire, but then, then I found this one. And I thought, this is perfect. 
this really, really describes in a simple, easy to understand slide, uh, everything we need to think about uh, in terms of integrating digital health uh, into the healthcare uh, environment. And you see, I'm obviously uh, being facetious because it is, there is no simple graphic. There is no simple way to explain this. Uh, it's complex and it's complex for a reason. Uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, even though it's causing us a big challenge. You know, this type of technology is, was revolutionary at the time and it allowed goods to be transported all over the world. And we still rely on it to transport goods all over the world. And it does what it does very, very well. But it's it's big and it's slow and it's reliable, but it's not necessarily agile and it's not necessarily open to innovation. And you know what happens when you deviate ever, ever so slightly from the plan, uh, little hiccups like this happen. And this was really, really funny a couple of years ago, but it's you may not remember, but this is a, a big, uh, container ship getting stuck in the Suez Canal. Um, and that's my analogy for, for, for the healthcare environment, maybe in North America, but uh, it's certainly doing what it needs to do very, very well for, you know, up until now, but there's a lot of places where it can be improved and the improvements are not necessarily very easy to integrate and, and to implement. So I'll summarize really, really quick. This could be a slide that maybe you can hang on to and I'll, I'll wrap it up, but remember that a true clinical need is where you want to start, uh, even to have a shot. How do you do that? Well, you know, besides just the one key opinion leader, that's KOL, uh, the one physician that's advising you, it's nice to have several physicians in different environments, giving you their perspective and leading you in different ways, but they are the ones that really define the unmet clinical need for you. You won't come up with it in the lab, that's for sure. Uh, make sure there's some, uh, you know, uh, some thought about the business early on because investors are going to come and ask you about what your plan for go-to-market is and you need you need help with that you need to understand how business is transacted in our field you're probably more than ready to develop the technical case you probably don't need as much help with that uh, but again like i said clinical efficacy you have to have people that are ready to integrate your tech at the test level and in both of those areas get early wins and move very very quickly to get to milestones to uh, ensure that you can keep funding the business. It's very challenging. Manage all of that safety and efficacy burden to make sure that when you get to Health Canada and the FDA, you're ready to go. Remember that it's challenging because it's changing. So as technology changes, the regulation has to keep up. And sometimes that causes uh, you more uh, challenge than you'd like, but it's for a good reason because we really have to make sure that things are safe, and that they're working properly. Partner with the right investors. I can't stress this enough. Um, the, the sales pitch is quite tough. It's a long runway with a high cash burden. Uh, not every investor is ready for that. So investors that have invested in health tech before understand that and investors that are looking for quick return are going to be disappointed. And if you manage to get all of that right, I'm not trying to discourage you. Uh, from joining our field in a startup, but remember the boulder uh, going up the hill, if you manage to get all of that right, then the real work starts. And that's selling to the five-headed monster and, and understanding how to make a viable business out of it. Uh, and take a page out of IntelliSense's uh, book, from proof of concept to a viable uh, clinical product that is actually improving outcomes and meeting uh, an unmet clinical need very strongly. All right, so with that, I'll hand it back to Adnan. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, that was incredibly insightful. So we really appreciate you sharing your uh, insights here with us. That's my pleasure. Recording stopped. Just uh, awesome. So I was just turning off the, the live stream and the uh, recording so we can get into questions and uh, Q&A. So the way we like usually do this is you can either put up your emoticon hand uh, on Zoom so that I can uh, add, name you and then you can ask a question through audio. If you want to come on video, you can do that as well. Um, alternatively, um, you can put in a question in the chat um, and I can read it out for Mark. Um, if you'd like it to be anonymous, um, you can send it to me privately uh, in the chat and I won't name you. Um, and I'll ask the question, um, so we can do it that way as well. Is that why we turn off the live stream and none in case we get heckled or? 
<laughs> Possible. <laughs> I, hope, I hope we don't get heckled. <laughs> no, I think this was very insightful. Um, you know, as we wait for questions, I, I had my own. So, you know, we are um, kind of seeking your input on the, the notion that, you know, we are a med tech talent accelerator. So more than we, uh, more than facilitating entrepreneurs to start building their own companies, um, we are actually in the, in the business of um, getting talent into such companies, be it startups, SMEs, and things like that. Now, would my understanding is that, you know, the, uh, it's a very complex space. So, you know, what would you say to talent that are not really looking for, you know, starting their own business, but they want to get into a med tech business? You, you know, what's your advice? Sure. I, I mean, I did, I did uh, position it from the, from the point of view of starting one or running one, but you, you know, all the same considerations apply uh, just as part of one, because you're whatever area of the business you're working, you're going to meet some or all of these challenges. Um, I guess if you're asking me what you need to think about once you're in it, I would say, you know, all of these things apply. If you're asking me how to choose one or how to navigate that, that transition, is that, is that the question? Which, which, uh, yes, I think, I think I'm on the both sides. I mean, one is, you know, we are, uh, we work with talent that are doing this transition. They're getting out of, uh, masters or PhD and they're looking to get into the industry and then. Once they do transition, you know, then they have to deal with what you've described for sure. Sure. I, I think one of the the early lessons that I learned, and I, I was very fortunate and it served me throughout my entire career and until today, uh, was some of the stuff that I talked about early on in the presentations, really thinking about the 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 entire chain of of the technology life cycle. You know, not just this is phenomenal and it works well. It's how is it going to be used and by whom? Uh, and I was lucky to be at the Neurological Institute in Montreal with, a, with an amazing supervisor who had uh, one foot in research and one foot in, in industry and was able to develop the technology in the actual clinical setting in R&D and then transition it to the company to, you know, to, to commercialize it. But we really got, as engineers, we were in both spaces with that, you know, with that business owner and that, that grad supervisor is the same, the same person. And he you know, it wasn't random that he had us do that. So as developing engineers and innovators, we were hands on with, with that magic user that I described, you know, how to find that user. Well, we were very lucky to be in the same lab as that user. So it was clinical on one side and it was research on the other. Uh, and we were every day with the people that were actually using the technology in a clinical, clinical you know, clinical context at the hospital. So, you know, the number one thing I can tell you as an engineer is think beyond, even though you're focused on the tech and getting it right, always think beyond the tech and think of who's benefiting and how, uh, and answer as many questions about the how and the why as possible. Um, and in terms of joining a company along the same lines, look for a startup that understands these things and founders that talk about more than just one aspect of it. The more they understand the holistic approach, the better they're gonna be able to navigate the very, very difficult task of fundraising and, and driving that business to, to viability because it's, it's grueling. So again, a holistic uh, philosophy on everything, the more you understand about all of that, the better, I think. Yeah, amazing, that's great advice. Um, so I have a question from Mark. Uh, please go ahead, Mark. Um, I, uh, thanks, Mark, it was, it was a great talk. I really appreciate uh, thanks, the information. Mark. Um, my question is, uh, I'm an undergrad student uh, at McGill in bioengineering, and um, I've kind of um, been getting more and more into this into this kind of um, business and um, engineering um, like a connection. Um, what advice would you have for undergraduate students in terms of how to get into this space um, with or without doing a master's? Because uh, I'm, I'm not sure mm -hmm. if I want to pursue the, the graduate school route. Um, sure. Because um, I did a research, a research this summer and um, I'm just not sure if this is something I want to pursue. Um, okay. What advice did you have in terms of post-grad opportunities for students who want to get into this kind of thing over here? What kind of what kind of tech are you are you studying right now? Biomedical. Um, so I was I was yes, yeah, so I'm doing bioengineering at McGill, and uh, my oh, research okay. was at the neuro. It was at the neuro in, in MRI physics. Oh um, great! But uh, I'm look I'm looking into more medical devices and, and, um, and digital applications as 
that, that's cool. yeah i think i think when i was when i was doing my undergrad the, the masters was um an easy decision because it was focused on biomedical my undergrad was in electrical um so i really wanted to focus on health tech and, and the masters at the time was the only way to do that what i what i benefited from was really focusing on one problem for two two years and then writing it up for a third year and, and coding it for a third year um it allowed you to 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 really focus on a problem deeply uh, and to solve it and you don't get that experience in undergrad but that doesn't mean that you can't jump into the field and learn that uh, in industry right so right now um our field as i said is exploding and companies are looking for technical talent that understands how to apply it to the medical field and i think 10 years ago i may have answered you differently mark but today i think there's so much opportunity for that uh that value um that choose choose a topic that interests you uh and and you'll be able to contribute uh as an engineer very very quickly thanks a lot i appreciate it you're welcome thank you um i have a question in the chat um they're talking about you know at home health devices um and really asking you about the reality of integrating them um within the healthcare system now you know they give the example trisana gives the example of you know it's really hard to even make an appointment right now with a family doctor you know is this are these healthcare home device health home devices really going to make uh healthcare ex- uh, access easier or you know is i i like how you phrase it you know are you solving a problem or creating <laughs> or, more or creating um, more Yeah, so okay, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean it's a, it's along the same lines as what I said. It's a great question. Uh and I really really appreciate that because maybe you were thinking that or maybe I helped you s- stimulate that that train of thought uh, during the presentation, but either way, it's critical. It's not just about the tech solution. It's everything that goes around it. How will it actually be used? And I think you're answering you're sorry, I think your question is asking really really great uh you know, pointing to really important aspects of this like will doctors have the time to monitor all this data when remote patient monitoring is measuring 100 times more the answer is absolutely not so can we trust the insights that the device will provide now we go back to not just you know not just doing a small validation of this device now we have to do a lot more and the health can and the FDA will because of that context will ask us to make sure the algorithms for example are working much better than we might they might need to work in a hospital because now we're not only measuring and providing insight we're also potentially determining what the physician will see because they can't possibly go through all of that so you know it's going to put pressure on on the algorithms from that point of view and again uh, another aspect it's difficult to make a basic appointment with a family doctor but these devices actually make healthcare easier uh we think of patient and doctor and i hope one of the things i illustrated today was that there's so many more uh critical stakeholders and people involved in getting information from the patient to the doctor and getting help from the doctor back to the patient there's dozens of people that need to do things in a great way to make that happen we haven't even talked about the government uh especially up here in Canada and and even in even at the state level in the US so um the answer is i don't know but i i i have to believe that we will because the need is so great and there's so much attention around it but i can tell you the truth um there's also a lot of noise there's also a lot of investment being done in things that we know have 0% chance of viability um not because they're too bold because there's too many elements of the of the critical puzzle are missing so the answer is it better i hope so uh but a lot has to get done for it to happen and and I, the one thing i can say is there have to there has to be champions there have to be these individuals that have a lot of experience and a lot of influence and a lot of passion to really 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 break uh barriers and and really make change uh and in, remember when i said you know the five-headed monster in the hospital yeah. there usually is one and it doesn't have to be in one particular group but in one of in, in those five groups there's usually one that is your champion and that person will do everything to influence the others and make sure that the meeting happens and make sure that the funds are reallocated and um finding those people is is critical and the field is looking for them right now um so uh yeah the this the challenge is great but it it has to be met we have no choice mm-hmm. awesome i like they put that there um so i have a question from greg about you know just the services bml health provides startups uh do you want to speak to that <laughs> 
yeah, I mean, we're not here to pitch the business, but um, in, a, in a general way, we're biomedical engineers and medical device uh, uh, professionals that have been in the field for over 20 years, and we're passionate about emerging tech. So we're helping any, anybody who needs, so small companies, startups, medium companies, and even big multinationals, helping them navigate the challenges of developing and commercializing emerging tech. That's where we really like to focus. So all of this, all of these new challenges we're talking about, we basically help companies develop compliant, safe, uh, efficacious, and regulated uh, medical device for commercialization. So we're a services firm, but we like to uh, work hand in hand with engineering teams and commercial teams as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark. I know we're a little bit over. I'm going to ask you one question because sure. you mentioned sure. emerging tech. Sure. Uh, you know, let's put AI to the side because, you know, we know that's <laughs> one of the biggest emerging techs out there yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, beyond AI, what are some emerging tech that you're seeing um, in the med tech space? Well, I'll touch AI for a second because, it's, okay. you know, AI is phenomenal technology that is not new, by the way. Calling it AI is not even new, but that's relatively new. I mean, we learned about these methods in, in engineering school, you know, 25 years ago. So. The mathematics have been around for decades and we understand modeling. I studied modeling at McGill in, in 2001. The application has become interesting because we're measuring so much data. So now that there's so much data, now we're saying what kind of, you know, what kind of technology is good for big data? And then you have this technology has been around for a long time is all of a sudden gaining a lot of popularity. The quick thing on AI is it is wonderful. Uh, it has amazing possibilities. It needs to be done in context of all these things we've been talking about. So it still needs to be done very responsibly and uh, incrementally. But I think there's a ton, a ton, a ton of opportunity um, around underserved populations. Like most people on the planet are not within driving distance of a hospital or, or clinical environment. So there's a lot to be uh, developed in terms of not just remote patient monitoring and telemedicine, which we understand, uh, but, but access to technologies that are historically in the hospital uh, having these kind of transportable uh, technologies is a big big um uh, you know big big aspect of the field right now a big opportunity but also gaining insights from that we're back to algorithms that whether they're based on ai or not will actually allow the physician to get quicker insight from all of this all of these measurements i think underserved populations is a big one and the other one is aging it is the number one a uh, health challenge in North America right now. Um, and the baby boomers are aging and, and there's a lot of people on the planet that are entering an age where they're going to need a lot more healthcare services and the system is not, uh, is not ready. The infrastructure is not ready to hold them all. So, uh, if you, if you spent the rest of your career thinking about underserved populations and aging, you'll probably be busy for a long time for sure. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that, Mark. Awesome. So, you know, Will, I, I wholeheartedly want to thank you. You know, this was incredibly insightful oh, I appreciate um, it. Um, uh, about the industry and about how you bring technologies to the healthcare system. So, again, thank you so much. I appreciate um, it. You know, thank you. Um, if you don't mind, if you want to unmute yourselves and just say thank you or clap or what have you as guests here, um, I would welcome that. Um, otherwise, you can leave it in the chat. Uh, but for my, uh, for me, you know, thank you, Mark. This has been really appreciated. Oh, I appreciate it very much, and uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Mark. It was really insightful. Okay, it was my pleasure. Really, thank you, everybody.